Uh, via telephone, we have two Spring Mills students with us. Uh, Aisha Sai, who is a graduating junior at the end of this year. Uh, Aisha, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. And Avery Keyes, who is also a junior. She will be back for her senior year. Avery, good morning to you. Good morning. So in Charleston, we've been debating the best way to deal with student discipline issues, as it's been one of the complaints that teachers and service personnel have had about returning to the classroom. But there have been many student incidents and there's got to be a way to deal with it because a very disruptive student can cause enough problems that it can affect the entire classroom, which then affects learning. And as we all know, in West Virginia, overall test scores are not good. And they tend to be more toward the bottom of the pile than uh, even the middle of it. So this is one of the ways they're trying to help teachers and service personnel deal with student disciplinary issues. And some of these uh, consequences would and could include suspensions from school, depending on the, the type of uh, or nature of the disciplinary situation, and also the number of times they've had to deal with the same student. I want to get your opinion as students in classrooms, first and foremost. Uh, what do you think about disciplining students by removing them from the classroom if they are creating too much of a problem and a disruption? And I shall start with you first. Once again, good morning to you all. I just want to start by saying thank you for having us on the radio today. Um, to answer your question about if we think disciplining students is a great way to handle behavioral issues, I find that a lot of times it lies within the mental health and home status. If the student is in a place where they feel unsafe or they feel like their needs are not being complied with, I think that carries over into the school building. And sometimes it may be easiest to take the student out of the classroom, but then it also relies on what resources are available for them once they leave. Avery? Yes, yeah, so I agree with Aisha and her statement. So the bill, we don't think that it's a bad bill. We don't think that its intent is bad. We think that some of the wording and some of it just has holes in it concerning the protections of students. So I agree with the need for the removal of our students in classrooms. It's just the wording of the bill. We discussed, had a few conversations with our peers and, you know, administrators about how we can put more pressure on those. And really, we were just focusing on the lack of protection um, for students. So the bill, we, we do agree with it. It's you know, we just really want to focus on that. How much How much of an issue has this been in your classes at Spring Mills and even growing up pre-COVID and post-COVID? And I shall start with you first. Sure. So after COVID and returning back to school as a freshman, you could see that there were definitely some gaps in the social aspect of it. A lot of students didn't know how to interact as well. And Especially, I have younger siblings, so at their level of school, it was definitely a little bit more difficult because their process of growing up got cut off due to the pandemic. So we saw that um, behavior was a little bit more different than before. But, of course, as the years went by, I think it's starting to settle down and be more normal for the majority of students. And as the bill is targeting K-6 through six students, I think that it's just a part of their growing up process and their brain maturing for them to be misbehaving at some time. Avery? Yes, so I think that the bill in some ways is a bit counterintuitive because, you know, one of the actions that are taken when after the student is removed from the classroom are, is they'll be sent to alternative ways of schooling. And we find that the social aspect in those schools is not the same or even close to what it would be like in a regular elementary or primary school for these young students. And we've seen through COVID how that can affect the generation, and it's not for the better, in my opinion. So. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, good morning, ladies. Uh, has this, has the problem got become worse since COVID? We're we're laying a lot of blame on many things due to COVID. But have you noticed the problem becoming worse during and subsequent COVID? Aisha, why don't you go first? Yeah. I think immediately after our return from quarantine, you could see that there were some behavioral problems. But for some, I think that was just there way of breaking out of that shell of being isolated for a really long time. So to answer your question, I don't think it's gotten substantially worse since COVID. You do not think it has, okay. 
Um, good morning. This is John Gilstrap. <clears throat> Thank you so much for coming on the on, on the show. These these are kind of issues when they deal with with students and especially smaller children. It it always it's always kind of an uncomfortable thing uh, to talk about, especially when there's an underlying mental health issue or whatever. But calling your attention to the bill, I have it up in, in front of me. The triggers for removing student from uh, from the classroom. Uh, let's see, determines, when the teacher determines the behavior of the student is violent, threatening, or intimidating towards staff or peers, or creates an unsafe learning environment, or impedes on other students' abilities to learn in a safe environment, the student shall be placed in behavioral intervention program. So it, the wording of this seems to me, it's, it's not about acting out, it's about creating a safety threat in the classroom. Uh, am I seeing this the wrong way? Aisha, go with you. Thank you for that. Personally, I believe that Senator Grady's use of the vocabulary intimidate or attempting to intimidate is very vague. So one of the things that we'd like to see improved in this bill is adding a definition of what intimidation means in the context of this bill. For example, how she did for the word student, teacher, and principal. I find that intimidation is very subjective and it's based on perception. So a teacher can use that as a way to take a student out of the classroom merely if the intimidation isn't as severe as we're considering it to be. Isn't that the same word, though, that is used if, if a student, for example, feels intimidated? The student would report the intimidation to uh, a teacher uh, or somebody, and there would be some disciplinary action, perhaps not as described here in the removal from the classroom, but that would trigger an, uh, disciplinary action, wouldn't it? I mean, the same word? Yes, I do believe they're the same word, but they're used in different contexts. As if you are a student who's intimidated, I can commit my opinion to this, but if I've had situations where I felt intimidated, I would report them, but that doesn't guarantee anything of that student being dealt with. But in this bill, say a teacher being intimidated ensures that the student is, by their authority, allowed to be taken out of the classroom. So I think they are the same word, but in the end, they're, using, they're used at different severities. Yeah. Uh, so why have you and Avery decided to speak up about this particular bill? I'd have to say that we chose to speak up on this bill because, as we mentioned before, there's not much protection for students. And as um, girls with younger siblings, we find that we want them to be protected in the way that their experience in school is protected by not only the law, but rules from their respective schools and their board of education. Avery? Similar? Yeah, and I find that it really can target minority groups and students with disabilities, you know, whether physical or learning. And with the teacher's interpretation of the bill, you know, they have the authority to, you know, like I said, interpret who they find intimidating. And, you know, you said, what's the difference between the student and the teacher, you know, claiming the other is intimidating. But I do feel one's in a position of power and the other isn't in that situation for discipline. So yeah. um, hold on a second there, yeah, Bill. Sure. Matt Harvey had contacted me and said that uh, the two of you wanted to speak about this uh, on the program. Are you getting a, a larger platform statewide in Charleston or in front of any legislators to uh, express your views, uh, Aisha? Yes, we're looking to potentially meet with Senator Grady and just proposing our concerns and ideas regarding this bill, because I think that's what this bill lacks. I've also looked at other bills from the D.C. area, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and they have similar bills, just a different format, where they provide different tiers to what the behavioral issues that are subject to a student being removed from the classroom are. So I think if our bill had something like that, it would be much easier to protect not only the students, but also the teachers. So we're looking to meet with Senator Grady and some of the other people up down in Charleston about this. How are you trying to arrange that? Is it through a particular individual or group? Yes, we're working with Elizabeth Brunello. She's a lobbyist down in Charleston, and she's helped us with all these different opportunities to spread and use as a platform. 
Bill, go ahead. Well, again, I applaud you, you, you ladies, uh, uh, taking a stand on this. Uh, there's been some criticism of the bill, uh, but much of the criticism has been uh, been in the direction that it's an unfunded mandate. Uh, in a urban environment, it tends to res- be resolved better than in the rural environment because there's a lot of the rural c- counties do not have a place, an alternative site in place for the disruptive students. Uh, how do you see that problem to be resolved? The question. Uh, yeah, which girl do you want to talk to? Uh, Bill? Uh, it makes no that. difference. Avery, Avery, uh, go to you. Okay. So I agree uh, from just personal experience and what I've seen that there's definitely a lack of resources and programs. And even if we have these programs, they're, they reach capacity often pretty quickly. You know, you can see where it will be counselors and psychologists and the ratio of how many students that they, you know, counsel, it's, I definitely agree that we need more funding for this bill if we want to see these programs really be effective. But there's no, actually there's no funding at all attached to this bill, so it's going to be a, a problem has been recognized, a solution has been proposed, but the solution is not accompanied by money, and it could be a fairly expensive project for a lot of school districts. And I guess that's a statement more so than a question. But let me ask uh, 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 Avery to respond to that. Uh, uh, how big a problem do you see this in the schools? Uh, the lack of funding or like resources, uh, the, counselors. The, the disruptive nature of the school, of the of the in the classes, is it a something that? All of us have been through schools, uh, been through classes, and I remember when I was in school, different time, different environment, uh, but there was always some disruptive students. Uh, but it was not disruptive to the point that we felt that action had to be taken. Have things changed the point now that students need to be uh, removed from the classroom? Do you believe that? So personally, I from my personal experience, I've had really good administrators, so I feel like handle situations really well. However, I don't feel like that's the case for all schools where the relationships between the students, teachers, and administrators um, are on that kind of level. And because this bill specifically targets younger students, I think it's hard to classify, you know, let's say a kindergarten or a five-year-old as disruptive when really, you know, social skills, they haven't, there's a lot that they haven't been taught in that area yet. You know, a kindergartner screaming, you know, that could be considered disruptive, but, I mean, that's just the social nature of one. That is an excellent, excellent point that I think is overlooked. The uh, the maturation process of the students, some of it some of it may not be disruptive, it's just the maturing of a particular student. So, uh, Avery and uh, Aisha, take me through the genesis of your concerns and then build it out to the point where you sought a format like this and then a greater format in Charleston in front of the education chair of the Senate, Amy Grady. Uh, How did you get from I'm concerned about this to I might get a meeting with Amy Grady? Who are the teachers or personnel who helped you get to that point? As I mentioned earlier, we worked with Ms. Elizabeth Brunello. She works down in Charleston, and she was expressing her concerns, and they were looking for student voice on this topic. And Avery and I are prevalent in a lot of student-led organizations at our school, and we love to just improve the climate culture of it and ensure that we are using restorative practices here at Springfield High School. So we thought if we could have a voice up from the Eastern Panhandle, which we think is progressing very quickly with all the people moving in, then we could use our voices to go down to Charleston and speak to Senator Grady so she could understand the impact that this bill will have not only on the students down in Charleston but also up here in the Eastern Panhandle. And Avery, is this part of a statewide movement of other kids in high schools all around the state of West Virginia? So we are looking to get into contact with more schools and that's I feel the next step in this. Obviously we have those connections down in Charleston and you know other parts southern counties so we definitely are looking to spread this further and hopefully just become, coming on here and other platforms will definitely spread awareness. And I feel students know about it issue and, you know, this really concerns them. They'll want to get involved. So I can see it working out. We are talking with Aisha Sai and Avery Keys. They are juniors at Spring Mills High School and they are 
discussing right now the disciplinary bills that have been uh, passed in some form or being amended in Charleston right now as the legislative session continues for another couple of weeks here. So is it right now just the two of you who are, are leading this uh this discussion, or have there? I know I asked you if there was a statewide group of you yet, but is, is it uh, so far just you two? No, we have some students in Jefferson County who are supporting this issue as well, and there are also some peers at our school, Martinsburg High School, who went down with me, myself personally, to Black Policy Day, which was a couple weeks ago down in Charleston, and we were able to meet our legislators and we learned about this bill that was coming up. So I came back home and talked to Avery about it. So we still have all those students from Black Policy Day still on board. I'm curious, in your own experience, um, as, as young people who are obviously good students and, and working your way on, into your futures, how prevalent an issue were uh, students acting out in the classroom and disturbing your ability to learn? Is that something that routinely happened, or has it not happened at all? Or what... What are we talking about here in, in terms of how common an issue this, this is? Personally, I I grew up in D.C. I also lived in Philadelphia, and I moved to West Virginia just after quarantine. But at the high school level, we don't see these interruptions very often because usually they're caught at an earlier age, at the middle school age when kids are maturing and growing up and finding their true personalities. So at the high school level, you definitely don't see it a lot, but at the middle school, I think you see it a little bit more. So that's why I find it's really important to ensure restorative practices where students can build connections with their teachers and we're promoting positive discipline, responsive classrooms, and reacting to misconduct by encouraging students to accept responsibility and rebuild relationships. So that was a resource that was offered at my middle school that I think worked very well, and you saw less students being taken out of classrooms for disciplinary disciplinary reasons and at the elementary level i think it goes without said that it happens a little bit more often than any other level and that's because the kids are just growing up they're maturing they're learning about their social environment and they need those resources to push them up and teach them from right and wrong is there is there a basic difference that you would if you had to make a change in the bill what would you change aisha I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but definitely adding definitions to the adjectives that Senator Grady uses. For example, intimidating, threatening, abusing, just for how she does for student, teacher, and principal. I think it'll just build some stronger guidelines as to what teachers can use this bill as for protection and also invoke a little bit more protection for students who think they might be being discriminated against because of this bill. So what, what is your, how did Lita Shepard get in touch with you folks? I was d- discussing this with Lita Shepard yesterday. That, that's who put me in touch with the two of you. And uh, she advocates, advocates for Americans, American Friends Service Committee. How did the, the two of you get in touch with Lita? Um, Miss Elizabeth Grinello got us in contact with her, but she gave us an alternate perspective on what she thinks about this bill, and she just honestly gave us a lot of the dice before we came on to this interview today. Understood. Okay. So uh, just to kind of recap, the, the two of you would prefer that, uh, other than, I would presume, cases of uh, violence uh, otherwise, uh, that there shouldn't be out-of-school suspensions, which I would agree with, uh, by the way, I, I think the only thing an out-of-school suspension serves to do is to continue to encourage kids who don't want to be in school to misbehave so they can continue to not be in school. So I, I think if we're doing suspensions, one, first and foremost, they mostly need to be in-school suspensions in some form or fashion. But, uh, but otherwise, uh, I, I think schools use suspensions as pretty much a last resort. I don't think they want to remove kids from the classroom. I think sometimes they just feel like they have to, and mostly for the benefit of the kids that are trying to get an education. Uh, in, in regards uh, to that, would the two of you agree with that? Uh, Avery, you go first. Yes, so I would agree with that. I would also like to point out the fact that if this leads to an increase in discipline actions like suspension, I do think that this is going to put, and, I, and I've spoken you know, to some administrators and I've heard feedback, I really do think that this is going to add pressure to teachers and to administrators, and that's something that we should focus on too because you know, I've heard feedback that some teachers, you know, don't believe that is their job necessarily to discipline students. They say, oh, I'm there for teaching, and that's just their opinion. And so that, that's some feedback I received. So I think that we also need to consider 
the pressure and that this will go um, the pressure for administrators. John, any final questions for our guests? Yeah, I did. <clears throat> I think what gets lost in these conversations sometimes, excuse me, <clears throat> what gets lost sometimes in these conversations are the kids who are the, for lack of a better term, not the troublemakers. And uh, school is should be, I think, focused on learning, just as you say. It shouldn't be focused on discipline. And I disagree with Rob that one of, you know, not as a not as a first option, but as a last resort, taking the the disruptors out of the classroom is the benefit of it is to the benefit of the students who are trying to learn. And we also we takes, agree on that. And it also takes care of the bullying issue at one level. That takes that out of play because the bullies are now put out of out of the classroom. That's the parents' problem, whether they're stepping up to it or not. That's that's a different issue. But that's a parenting problem for them to take their their bad acting kids and and bring them under control. By taking them out of the classroom, we bring peace to the classroom, and I think that's a good idea. Well, we agree on that. I, I don't think disruptors should be a- allowed to remain in the classroom. I think they need to be in school suspensions, but that doesn't mean they stay in the classroom. Okay. We, we don't uh, disagree on that. Yeah, the, Rob, the ladies are following this very closely. Where are we in the process? Has it passed out of the Senate? Has it been introduced in the House? Does anyone know? From what I understand, it's still being discussed in the Senate. I thought it had actually been passed out of the Senate, but I don't know for a fact. So it might be in the House. That's a good question. Mm-hmm. So uh, do the two of you know, is is that something that uh, obviously you're still trying to advocate against it? So it has, obviously hasn't been signed by the governor yet. It's not, a, it's not a law that's in force. I know that it's still progressing forward. Um, there's a bill in the House right now and a bill in both the Senate. So they're on either side. And I think they're being reviewed right now by each of the education committees. Also, if I can add, one of you mentioned how it would be taking the bullies out of the classroom. I don't think it's really fair to label any student who's interrupting or threatening as a bully. I think that those are pretty subjective adjectives. And in the case that a student is disrupting the classroom area, it might just mean that they're troubled. So to use such an adjective like bullied, I don't think is suitable for this. Well, you have the right to your opinion, but we disagree, <laughs> <laughs> having been through the education yeah. process. Uh, Aisha and Avery, any final thoughts before we let you get back to school? Uh, I think I think we covered it all. All right, good. Hey, right. P- appreciate your time on the program this morning. Good luck to you in your lobbying efforts. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you, ladies. Take care. And again, thank you to uh, Lita Shepard for helping to set that up and uh, – and through Matt Harvey, uh, that got uh, we had a cancellation this morning. The, the Senate moved their caucus to uh, eight o'clock. It had been at eight thirty, so we had Senator Jason Barrett scheduled at eight a.m. And I got uh, late notice yesterday from uh, Jason that he wouldn't be able to make it. And then after a conversation with Craig, I learned that the caucus had moved to eight and would be that way through the rest of the. A session because there's a lot of work to do and they need to get an earlier start. So the uh, the suggestion from Matt had come to me and we tried to put that together. And as you could tell, as we were doing the interview, we were kind of piecing it together as we went along there too. But in regards to uh, the ladies themselves, uh, they did a great job advocating their point. Uh, they are students in the school and they're seeing what they see firsthand. It's been a long time since any of us were in a classroom. We remember what it was like to be in a classroom, but Clearly, that was well back in the rearview mirror. Exactly. I admire the courage of people, of young people that age, to come on to on, onto a radio station and and to lobby a point. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of their points, but I think I really, really admire the courage to do it. Well, mm-hmm. the courage is part of it, uh, and I really admire the courage as well. But the fact they're engaged, the fact yes. they're thinking about the process, the fact they're willing to come forward and discuss it, I think is very admirable. Speaks exceptionally well for our youth of today. Uh, Aisha, who is graduating as a junior, is was telling me that she's looking to get into policy work in Washington, D.C., therefore wants to go to a school in D.C. so she can be right down there by Congress yeah. and uh, get further involved in politics. Uh, Avery will be back for her senior year at uh, Spring Mills High School.